can double check my settings. Okay, we are now currently recording. Um, so let's go ahead and, and start off with uh, any any questions. Well, no, before that, um, I did uh, take a look at the mini project one and there is a, a typo in one of the solutions. Let me, um, hold on one second. Let me pull that up and, uh, Let's see. So um, I will be giving back points for that since that typo is on my uh, my end and is not any fault of of yours. Um, but I will have to do that after the due date. So um, just be aware of that. It is uh, question two that has a typo. So um, just be aware that that um, did happen. I am going to be, uh, again, going through and giving points back for, for that uh, question as long as you have input the correct solution, uh, but it does have a typo. So um, just be aware of that. Uh, with that out of the way then, uh, are there any questions from any of the material or homework so far? Oh, I actually um, have one. Oh, yes, go ahead. So, so uh, I was trying, so I was looking into my map lab yesterday and uh, just a quick question about the access code. Uh, do we get it like the moment we uh, make our Paulson account? Well, like, can it, can it be found somewhere on Canvas? Um, it's, so when, uh, since we are, that's a good question. Um, since we are syncing up the account with Web Campus, uh, when you log in using Web Campus, that's when it will uh, input the code automatically. Um, so oh. let me let me uh, go back. Let me let me share this uh, real quick. Share the screen. Um, so when you log into Web Campus, there should be this this uh, My Lab and Mastering tab here. When you mm -hmm. click on it, um, it will have a login page here. Uh, I've already logged in, so it has has this, but um, You'll log in and, and it will input the link uh, from this page automatically. Oh, I'm okay. And uh, along with like purchasing the access code, we also purchased a book. Uh, yeah. The so the well, that is that is a good question. Um, the the access code does come with uh, with, with the book. Uh, but not a physical copy. So um, you you will have access to the ebook, but not the um, not the hard copy. If you want a hard copy, you'll have to purchase that on your own. But if you are fine with the ebook, then yeah, it does come with that. So if so, in order to get the code, we we'll have to access. But we have to purchase the ebook. Uh, was that? So in order to put, so in order to get the access code, we need to purchase the ebook. Uh, no, the if when when you create when you create a so okay, uh, let me start over. Um, if you have purchased a new textbook from the bookstore, say, uh, then it will come with an act with the uh, Pearson account code. Uh, so then you can log in with that code that they give you. It will, you've already paid for that Pearson account. If you have oh. not, okay. So did that, did that hopefully answer that question or? Yeah, if they're not, just from, okay. if they're just from Polonia, that I don't have the money to buy the book yet. So, so okay. like. Um, so, well, okay. So uh, go ahead and send me an email and we'll, we'll get that taken care of. We'll get that sorted um, okay. out. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other I don't possibility. Have the money yet. Yeah, oh, and I know that for for some of the. Um, so I think I think there are some students that have not yet received their financial aid yet. So, um, but. Um, yeah. the The other possibility that you have is you can purchase the account just by itself without purchasing the textbook. 
And when you log in, let me um, maybe show this this screen. Let me see if I can share this screen. So when you log into Pearson here, uh, there will be a, a tab here that says eText, and when you click on that. It will open uh, an electronic copy of the textbook here. Um, so there is that possibility as well. So either one is fine. Um, personally, I prefer the physical copy of the textbook, but that's just me. Uh, some students prefer the electronic copy, so they don't buy, they don't buy the new book. They just purchase the Pearson account. Uh, but I'll leave that up to the student to decide. So um, those okay. are the, those are the two options. Yeah. Um, but if you if you purchase the Pearson account just from their website, it does not come with the with the physical copy of the book, just the electronic copy. Just the ebook. Yes. Okay, I'm I'm cool with the ebook. Okay, uh, so like I said, I'll, I I leave that up to uh, students to decide what they want to do with that. So. Okay, and since uh, we had homework that was due to, that was due Sunday, which required the which required the account. Well, some of us who don't have it yet due to financial problems, like well, that's so. Still if up. so, if you if you've had financial problems and you haven't had access to it, just uh, send me an email and we'll we'll get that taken care. Of. We'll we'll coordinate something. Um, with the financial problems, especially with you know the financial aid not coming through yet, uh, I'm willing to extend those assignments. Um, the way that it's programmed in, I'll have to wait until after your account is is uh, created. But uh, send me an email and we'll I'll extend those. Assignments. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Oh, and I, oh, I did see a question in chat. Um, oh, that is so the, the typo was uh, for the mini project, which is not, not through Pearson. That's the, the, um, the mini project quiz one on Web Campus. No, uh, the, the mini project, what does that involve? Um, so that's, basically going to be a summary of the uh, chapter one material. Um, so it's going to go through, it will have uh, one question on uh, matching an argument with the fallacy that was given uh, or the fallacy that appears in that argument. It'll have one um, where you identify the premise and the conclusion. And I think that one is also one that has uh, uh, fallacies. So you'll identify the fallacy. And then the third one is analyzing an argument, which is what we will be uh, lecturing on today. So it's it's basically a summary of the uh, chapter one material, and uh, that's that's going to be um, the pattern for these as well. Uh, so mini project two will be a summary of the chapter two material. Mini project three a summary of the chapter three material. Um, so, so we don't write a summary; we just answer the questions. Yes, that is correct. Yep. Um, so you'll you'll basically um, log into Web Campus. You'll click on the quiz, uh, and it'll have I believe this first one has five, four or five questions, um, and then you'll just go through and, and answer them uh, via a spread from again the, the material from chapter one. All right. Oh yes, I, I also will be fixing the due date on on Pearson. Um, yeah, uh, those I, I fixed the due dates for last week. I didn't have enough time to fix all of the due dates, just the ones for last week. So it looks like there's a lot that's due this weekend, uh, but that is not that is not the case. It's whatever we finish this week. Um, so I will be going through and fixing those those due dates. Um, I believe I should have some time this week to to fix most of those, so. Um, all right, uh, any other questions? Oh, I lost my chat window. Where did that go, sorry. Oh, there it is. 
Okay, I don't see anything in chat and I'm not hearing any questions, uh, but I will keep my eye on chat in case you are wanting to um, ask through the chat instead of over audio, that's fine. Uh, and I do know there's a little bit of a delay, so I'll keep my eye on chat and answer any questions as they come along. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into the material. So today we're going to finish up chapter one. Uh, so our, our last section is section 1D, which is what we'll be lecturing on today. And, and uh, I believe we should also be able to get into uh, chapter two. Um, I think what I will do for for this one, I'm going to try, uh, I'm still, still trying to find the best way to uh, present the material. Um, in in a digital way. So I am going to we'll 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 try. I think what I will do um, is I I will probably um, use some of the some of the text function uh, from this program so I can type instead of handwrite, uh, which should help with both legibility and speed, but we'll see. Um, so section one D is on analyzing arguments. So in this section, we're going to take a closer look at some arguments and how we can analyze those um, in a way to determine um, certain properties of the, of the argument itself. And we're going to look at two general types of arguments. So the first one is inductive. Yeah, so let, again, let's let's uh, let's try this text tool and see if that works better. Um, so an inductive argument makes a case for a general conclusion from more specific premises. So what is uh, happening with this is we have uh, a specific case. So let's say case one, another case, case two, and these are our premises, another case, case three. So these are the premises. And from these, we're drawing a general rule which is going to be our conclusion. So we're uh, from these formul formulating a general conclusion, general rule from these specific cases. So we're taking individual cases. Uh, here's this case, first case, second case, third case, however many premises we have. And they all seem to be following this general rule. So our conclusion is the general rule or uh, sometimes is the general rule applied to um, applied to a specific case. And we'll, we'll see that uh, in some of the examples. The other type of argument that we're looking at will be a deductive argument. So a deductive argument makes a case for a specific conclusion from a more general premise. All right. So what we have going on here for a deductive argument, we have a, a premise that is a general rule. So here's our general uh, rule or premise. Um, yep. Sorry, waiting for the program to catch up. Premise. And we are applying this to a specific case. And so um, we're applying this to a specific conclusion. So um, the uh, inductive, we start with basic cases and we make a, a general rule from those cases. 
Whereas the deductive argument is kind of going the opposite way. You have, you have, you have this general rule and a specific case that fits this rule. And so we apply the rule to that specific case. And so those are the two types of, of arguments that we're looking at. Um, so let's look at some examples of these arguments. And then we're going to, um, first we'll start with the inductive arguments. What can we uh, do with those? How can we analyze those? Uh, and then we'll uh, look at the um, deductive arguments and do the same thing. So we're gonna start with uh, first looking at an example. So let's, um, for this, let's identify uh, which type of argument is being made. And this first one, Uh, let's see here, premise one, premise one, birds fly and eventually land. Premise two, um, people who jump into the air fall back down. Premise three, rocks that are thrown into the air fall back down. And so our conclusion is what goes up must come down. Okay, so this is our first example, uh, we want to identify what argument is being made. So for this, uh, this example, what, what argument do we have? What type of argument? Do we have an inductive argument or a deductive argument? Inductive. Inductive, why? Uh, because uh, the conclusion is drawn from different cases. Exactly right. This is an inductive argument because the conclusion is drawn from specific cases. Case one, birds fly, they go up into the air, they come back down. The second one, when people jump, they fall back down. Third one, when we throw a rock up into the air, it falls back down. So the general conclusion, what goes up must come down. Now with the inductive arguments here, um, while we are looking at this specific case, we have to be a little bit careful. Um, so one thing that I could ask with this is, in, is the conclusion true or false? And this one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna warn you, is it, it's a little bit of a trick question. So um, go ahead and you can, you can either um, say in the audio whether you think this is true or false, the conclusion, or uh, type in the chat whether you think this is true or false. I personally think it depends on whether the place you're talking about has oxygen, because like, if we're in space, because there's no oxygen in space, things got that go up, they never, they probably never come down. R right. But so that's good. That's good. So it also depends on the context of that the argument is being made. And I saw another false there. Um, good. And there's also another case. Even if we apply this uh, argument to Earth. What about uh, satellites or rockets that we launch into space? Those go up, but they do not come back down, or at least if the math is correct, they don't come back down. So uh, in this case, the conclusion is false. Um, Couldn't you say that it's mostly true for, you know, for uh, because of gravity, but that we have developed some scientific things that can, you know, burst through the gravity? Yes. Uh, and we're actually going to have a, that. That is actually very good. That is very good. We could say that. Um, we're going to have a specific terminology for that. So we will come back to that. But that is exactly right. So notice in most cases on Earth, when we're making this argument, that is true. But there could be some cases. So back um, several centuries before we had rocket technology, people would have said, yeah, this, this conclusion is true. But once we've developed rockets, when we can break the um, gravitational pull of the Earth, 
all of a sudden this is now false in, in, in the context of that. Um, but the, the mostly true, that is, I, I like that terminology. We're going to use a little bit of a different uh, wording for that, but keep that in, in your mind. That is very good. All right, uh, but before we do that, let's look at the next argument. So the next argument, uh, premise one, um, all politicians are married. Premise two, Senator Harris is a politician. And I don't think I have spelled that correctly. <laughs> Conclusion, uh, Senator Harris is married. Okay, so for this one, is this inductive or deductive? Deductive, that is correct. And why? It is a deductive argument. Uh, so it's using a specific rule. The rule is all politicians are married. And we're noticing Senator Harris fits this. He is a politician. Therefore, we apply the general rule to that specific case to Senator Harris. So we have a, a general case applied to a, or sorry, a general rule applied to a specific case. All politicians are something. Senator Harris is one of these, is a politician. Therefore, we apply the rule to Senator Harris. Okay, very good. Um, so let's go back to inductive arguments. So inductive arguments are a little bit, um, a little bit trickier, I would say, than the deductive arguments. Inductive arguments. Uh, let's write, let's phrase it this way: an inductive argument cannot prove its conclusion. or cannot prove uh, that its conclusion is true. That is not possible. Um, so instead, so when we are analyzing an inductive argument, oh, okay. Let's try that inductive argument. We can only say whether it is a strong argument or a weak argument. And so a strong argument makes a, ooh, yep. <laughs> this is gonna take me some getting used to, so I apologize. A strong argument uh, makes a compelling case for its conclusion or has a lot of cases applied to it. So um, here, going back to what was said uh, before, which I really liked, the uh, mostly true, we're actually going to say, uh, instead of mostly true, we're going to say it's a strong argument. There are a lot of cases, in fact, most cases that you can think of for the previous inductive argument example, um, do apply that, uh, do fit that rule. That rule does apply to it. So it is a strong argument. Um, whereas something that is not, that does not have as many cases or does not seem to fit, we would say is a weak argument. So um, another example of this, so let's look at another example. Um, let's determine whether the given inductive argument is strong or weak. And um, let's see, let's do this one. Every day of my life, the sun has risen. So tomorrow the sun will also rise.
So this is an inductive argument that was given to us, but let's, again, let's analyze why, figure out why this is an inductive argument. We're taking specific cases, in this case, the case of every day of my life, something has happened, the sun has risen. So the general rule that seems to apply there is that the sun will rise the next day. So our conclusion is tomorrow the sun will rise. So um, would you say that this is a strong argument or a weak argument in, in terms of inductive arguments? Strong, I think it's strong. Strong, and why? Because uh, if the sun rises every day of your life, then there's a high chance that it will rise tomorrow as well. Correct. So notice um, every day of, of my life, that is a lot of cases. Um, that's 365 days times however, however long you've lived, how many years you've lived. So that is a lot of cases. Uh, if, if we had changed that, if we had said, well, yesterday the sun rose, so tomorrow the sun will also rise, then that's not as strong an argument. We are only applying one case to, one case to the argument. Um, now, for this, there, there might be some, uh, some wiggle room in determining whether something is strong or weak. Uh, what I'm looking for is the reason why. So uh, just keep in mind that a strong argument either makes a very compelling case for its conclusion or has a lot of cases applied to its conclusion. And a weak one does not have, it, it does not make a strong argument, it does not make a compelling case or it does not have nearly enough uh, cases applied to it. Uh, so again, that, that reasoning right there, that is what I'm looking for. So strong or weak, why? Well, I think this is strong because it makes a compelling case, or I think this is strong because it uses a lot of cases, or this is a weak argument and I think it's weak because it does not make a compelling case for the conclusion, or this is a weak argument because it doesn't have very many, very many specific cases it's applying to make this general rule, just one or two here and there. All right. So inductive arguments, that is really all that we can say, because again, an inductive argument, you cannot prove your conclusion. You can only uh, determine whether it, you can either have a strong argument, uh, a strong inductive argument or a weak inductive argument. You can't uh, prove your conclusion. Deductive arguments are different, however. With deductive arguments, since we are applying a general rule to specific cases, we can uh, prove our conclusion. And so uh, there are actually two questions that we are going to ask ourselves when we are analyzing a deductive argument. So to analyze a deductive argument, we ask ourselves two questions. Uh, first question, does the conclusion follow necessarily from the premises? And two, are the premises true? So we're asking these two questions. Before I move on, I'm, I am a little bit uh, worried about this. I want to ask you guys, um, how, how, is, how, how do you guys feel about uh, this text instead of the writing by hand? Do you, do you find this, uh, is it legible? Is it, uh, do I need to increase the font? Increase the size, okay. It's good, it's better, okay. Okay, all right. So we'll try this. I'm just going to, let me see if I can adjust the size here. Let's see. Um, would that, is that, um, let me let me ask, is this, is this a good size? Can you guys read this better? It's good. Okay. It's better for me. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go with this then, we'll try this. All right, excellent, okay. Um, I appreciate you guys' feedback too. And uh, thanks, for, thanks for your patience with me. 
Um, okay, so let's let's continue on with this then. So to analyze a deductive argument, we ask ourselves these two questions. Does the conclusion follow necessarily from the premises? Another way to say that is, if the premises are true, does the conclusion have to be true? We want that answer to be yes. The, the stronger the argument is, or sorry, the best deductive arguments, the answer for that is yes. And the second question, are the premises true? And so we have some terminology for, for this when we are analyzing a deductive argument. If the conclusion must follow from the premises, we call the argument valid. So a valid deductive argument means that if the premises are true, the conclusion cannot be false. The conclusion must follow from the premises. And so uh, that is a very strong statement that's saying, uh, notice for this one, for the validity, we haven't said anything about the premises. We're saying if the premises are true, the argument cannot be false. And so that is the first uh, the first terminology, that's our first question. And my program is froze a little bit. There we go. Just waiting for that to, so valid is the first term, valid or not valid. The second thing that we're going to look at is uh, a second terminology is if, if an argument is valid and all of its premises are true, then we call the argument sound. So for a sound argument, uh, two things must be true. First, the argument must be valid. So uh, whether an argument is valid or not is always going to be the first thing that we will check. And second, all of the premises have to be true. Um, for, for this course, we're going to look at uh, some, most, most of the arguments we look at will not have very many premises. Uh, so it will be fairly easy to um, analyze the argument to determine whether the premises are true or false. In other courses, if we were if we were going more in depth, we could have we could uh, in theory have a deductive argument that is a hundred premises. If ninety nine of those premises are true, but only one is false, then it cannot be sound. So every single premise, all of the premises have to be true. Okay. So just to reiterate that, in order for an argument to be sound, two things must happen. It must first be valid, and we're going to uh, look at that next. And second, all of the premises must be true. If those two things are met, then it is a sound argument. So um, that answers, if we go back to the questions that we're asking ourselves, that answers question two, are the premises true? The harder question is this first one, does the conclusion follow from the premises? Is the argument valid? So what we are going to do to determine whether an argument is valid, whether a deductive argument is valid or not, we're actually going to use our Venn diagrams. So um, let's make a note here and then look at how, our, how we will analyze a deductive argument. Um, so all deductive arguments for this course will have either a categorical proposition or a conditional for one of its premises. All right, so uh, in the last chapter, we talked about our uh, categorical propositions. We had four of those. The first one that was the um, all P, R, S, I, or I don't remember what letters we used, P and Q, I think, all P, R, Q. Um, there were four, uh, four of them in total. So 
the first thing that we're going to do, well, let's, I guess, uh, then follow this up. So to analyze whether a deductive argument is valid or not, we do the following. Step one, we're going to draw a Venn diagram representing all of the premises. And again, we can do this because in the last, in the last section, when we introduced the um, categorical propositions, we had a, a associated Venn diagram. So the only thing we have to worry about is the conditional, but we'll look at an example of that at the end of the, uh, after uh, an example or two. And then step two, we want to check Oh, there we go. We want to check whether the conclusion matches the Venn diagram. If it matches, then the argument is valid. Otherwise, it is not valid. Okay, so those are the steps that we're going to go through. So first, again, we're going to draw a Venn diagram for all of the premises. We're going to leave the conclusion out. We're gonna draw a Venn diagram representing the premises. Second, we're going to check, does the Venn diagram match what we would expect from the conclusion? If it matches, then the argument is valid. If it doesn't, then the argument is not valid. So let's look at an example for this uh, in analyzing an argument. So let's get a deductive argument. Uh, let's determine if the given deductive argument is valid and whether it is sound. So again, we're going to be looking at these two questions. Is it valid? Is it sound? All right, premise one. Oh, sorry. Um, the second step was to check whether the conclusion matches the Venn diagram. So we're going to um, for well, what I am going to have us do, we'll draw a Venn diagram uh, for the conclusion on its own and see if it matches. Okay. Um, so let's look at this one. Uh, premise one. All fruits are foods with sugar. Premise two, chocolate bars contain sugar. And the conclusion, chocolate bars are fruit. So here is our deductive argument. We want to determine, is this argument, well, first we start with the question, is this argument valid or not valid? So notice that this first argument here, or the first premise here is a categorical proposition, all P, R, Q. And if you recall from our last section, the uh, associated Venn diagram for this is the subset relation. So, so we have a, a set inside of a set and here, the subset are fruits. And the bigger set are foods with sugar. So that is our first premise. So our first premise, again, because our first premise is a categorical proposition, we can draw the associated Venn diagram for that. All right. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. Then we have one more premise, chocolate bars contain sugar. So what we're going to do in the Venn diagram, we're going to draw an X where chocolate bars live in the Venn diagram. 
So uh, we're ignoring premise one, we're ignoring the conclusion. So we're just looking at just focusing on premise two, chocolate bars contain sugar. So chocolate bars contain sugar, where should then chocolate bars live in this Venn diagram? Inside the blue circle? Good, yes, inside the big circle is correct. Do we know from premise two, from premise two, just, just premise two, whether the X is inside the uh, small circle, the fruit circle or not? No, we don't know for sure whether it fits or not. Just right, Prems 2 doesn't tell us anything about, about whether it's fruit. So notice we have two possibilities. It goes here or it goes here. It could, it could meet either, either condition. When we have something like this, so it's, it's, uh, it could either be inside of the fruit circle or outside of the fruit circle, but we know it has to be inside of the big one. Uh, to simplify that notation, we're going to uh, have that written as an X on the boundary to indicate that it could either be inside of the small circle or outside of the small circle. So we'll just put an X on the boundary to indicate that it could go either way. So this is our Venn diagram. Um, so you wouldn't see the blue, you just see the red, although that could be also in black um, if you don't have colors uh, that you're writing with. All right. So that is, the, that is the first step. Step one, draw a Venn diagram representing all of the premises. So here is our Venn diagram. Next, we want to see whether this uh, matches the conclusion. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the conclusion. We're just going to look at the conclusion itself. Um, and if we were to draw a Venn diagram for just the conclusion, what would that look like? Well, we would have the uh, set fruit, the circle fruit, and the X would be inside of it. That is what the conclusion is saying, is that chocolate bars are fruit. And so what we want to do is we want to ask ourselves, does this match? And again, we're looking at, we're, we're pretending that the blue inside of the left uh, Venn diagram does not exist. So just the red X. Does this match? Is the X absolutely 100% inside of the fruit circle? I'm seeing a no, good. And yeah, so the answer is no, these do not match. So it is not valid. Okay. So if the Venn diagram for the conclusion matches the Venn diagram for the premises, it is valid. In this case, it does not match because the X could go either way. It might be inside the fruit circle. It might be outside the fruit circle because it does, because we don't know for sure it doesn't match, then it is not valid. Next, is the conclusion, is this argument sound? I don't think so, because it's, if it's not valid, how can it be sound? Exactly right. Yep. In order for an argument to be sound, it must be valid first. This is not valid, so it is not sound. Very good. Okay. Let's look at another example. for analyzing these. Let's look at another, uh, another, let's analyze another argument. So again, we want to determine, oh, let me change that back. Okay, we want to determine whether the given, whether the uh, deductive argument is valid and whether it is sound. Premise one, all cats are mammals. Premise two, Garfield is a cat. Conclusion, Garfield is a mammal. Okay, 
So here is our deductive argument. So again, the first thing we want to do, step one, will always be to draw the Venn diagram representing the premises. So uh, in this case, we notice that our first premise, premise one, is a categorical proposition, all P are Q, all cats are mammals in this case. So we can draw a Venn diagram for premise one, the all, uh, all PRQ is a subset relation. So we draw a subset relation here. The subset are cats. The bigger set are mammals. So that is premise one as a Venn diagram. So again, the first thing we do, what I would, what I would recommend doing is um, drawing the Venn diagram for the categorical proposition first. Usually it will be the, the first premise. Next, uh, we want to put Garfield into the Venn diagram as an X. So where does Garfield live uh, according to premise two? Inside the cat circle. Inside the cat circle. Yep, that is exactly right. And I'm also saying that in chat, so very good. So there is Garfield. So that is premise one and premise two in our Venn diagram. Next, we want to check whether the conclusion would match that. So our conclusion is Garfield is a mammal. So according to our conclusion, if this had its own Venn diagram, we would have a mammal circle and Garfield would be right inside of it. Does this match? is the question. So do these Venn diagrams match? I am seeing some yeses, good. These do match. The X is inside of the mammal circle. In fact, it's inside of the cat circle, it's even more strict, but it is inside of the mammals circle. So this is, so yes, therefore it is valid. This argument is valid. Okay, next we want to determine whether it is sound. So remember, in order for an argument to be sound, it has to meet two conditions. First, it has to be valid, that's met. Second, all of the premises have to be true. Are the premises true in this argument? Premise one, all cats are mammals. That is true. Premise two um, might be the one where you might start to trip up on, but we're going to assume that the person presenting the argument is always going to tell the truth um, for a specific object or person or animal, uh, so on. So in this case, we don't know who Garfield is, but we're going to assume that the person making the argument is not going to lie and, and say that Garfield is a cat when Garfield is not. So Garfield is a cat, we can take the person making the argument at their word. Or it could we could fit in any other name, Rex or um, Jimmy. Jimmy is a cat. Again, we're going to assume that the person making the argument is not going to lie about that. So we can assume that premise two is true. Premise one is true. Premise two is true. All of the premises are true. So this is a sound argument. So maybe let's, uh, I'm running out of, I ran out of space here. Maybe write that here, premise one is true. Premise two is true. So this is sound, a sound argument. Okay. All right. So the last type of deductive argument that we have is going to be a, a deductive argument that has a conditional instead of a categorical proposition. So let's look at uh, what is a conditional and what is the associated Venn diagram for it. So a conditional is a statement in the form if P then Q. And 
it has the following associated Venn diagram. So here again, P and Q are going to be statements. Oh yes, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> let's take attendance. So if you're here, uh, type into chat uh, here. Uh, thank you for the reminder. Um, so the uh, P and Q are statements. So if P then Q, that is our conditional. So let's draw the associated Venn diagram. For this, actually, the Venn diagram is also uh, a subset relationship. Um, so let's draw that. So we have our Venn diagram. This is a subset relation. So we have a set inside of a set. And here, this is going to be P, this is going to be Q. So again, the same, uh, the same steps apply. We draw the Venn diagram associated with the premises, which we can do because here, if we have a conditional, we are now given the associated Venn diagram. And then we check, does the conclusion match? So let's look at a deductive argument that uses a conditional. Okay, so let's determine whether the given deductive argument is, val is valid and whether it is sound. Okay, premise one. If you are literate, then you are a college graduate. Premise two, Tom is not a college graduate. Conclusion, Tom is not literate. Okay, so here is our deductive argument. We want to determine whether this is valid and whether this is sound. So again, this one, instead of, instead of a categorical proposition, we have a conditional. That is our first premise. So our first premise then, uh, our conditional, we can draw a Venn diagram associated with that. So let's draw our Venn diagram associated with the conditional. So we have a set inside of a set. And the smaller set is the first thing that happens in the, in the conditional. So if you are literate, so this is going to be literate, then you are a college graduate. So this is going to be college graduate. So there is our first premise as a Venn diagram. Next, we want to put in the second premise. So we want to put in Tom in the Venn diagram. So where does Tom live inside of this Venn diagram? Outside the circle. Yeah, wouldn't he be in the square area? Yep, he's in the universe, but outside of the big circle. Exactly correct. Yep. So there is Tom. So that is our premise one, premise two. Next, step two, we want to check does the conclusion match our Venn diagram? So the conclusion, we have a circle that is literate. And for our conclusion, where does Tom live in our conclusion uh, Venn diagram? Outside the literate circle is correct. Good. Mm -hmm. And so we ask ourselves, does this match? I think, yeah, someone's, someone's, uh, Skipping ahead, but that is correct. So does this match? Yes. Yes, so this is valid. Next, we wanna ask, is this sound? So 
And again, in order for a deductive argument to be sound, it has to meet two conditions. First, it has to be valid that we have checked it is valid. Second, all the premises have to be true. So let's start with premise one. Is premise one true? I don't think so. People can be uh, people can be self-taught or they can, you know, college graduate. I mean, you learn basically to read in, in grammar school, right? In high school, you, you could be a high school graduate and then still be literate. Exactly right. So premise one is false. Premise one, uh, there are individuals that are literate that are not college graduates. In fact, there are tons <laughs> of, of literate individuals that are not graduates, uh, college graduates. So premise one is false. So is this argument sound? No. No. So this is not sound. It is valid, but it is not sound because here, let's maybe write that premise one is false. So this argument is, so here's an argument that is valid, but is not sound. Okay. Uh, any questions up to this point? All right, uh, that is section 1D. So section 1D, um, we analyze arguments. We uh, have two types of arguments. We're analyzing inductive and deductive. Uh, an inductive argument, just as a reminder, we're going from specific cases to a general rule and we cannot prove the conclusion. We cannot prove the general rule as true or false. So for an inductive argument, we can only say it is strong or weak. The second type of argument we have is a deductive argument where we start with a general rule that is applied to a specific case. So we have a general rule and someone or something is part of this general rule as it fits in here. And so then we make a conclusion about that specific person or thing. And for a deductive argument, we can determine if it is valid or not. So it is valid if uh, an, a deductive argument that is valid means that as long as the premises are true, the conclusion cannot be false. Then we ask, is it sound? And so in order for an argument to be sound, it has to be valid, first off, and second off, all of the premises have to be true. So a sound argument, the conclusion is always true for a sound argument. Not for a valid argument, but for a sound argument. Um, okay, so inductive, strong or weak, deductive, valid, not valid, sound, not sound. Those are the questions that we're asking when we're analyzing these. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, jump into chapter two, unless there are any questions or comments. Well, I have questions because I was reading the 1D last night. Uh, and, yes. And it gets kind of confusing when they start at the end of it, they have all these questions. And, and I noticed there's like four different, you know, with the, with the conditional ones, there's four different ways and two of them are valid and two are not. And when they have just the P and the Q, it's very confusing to me <laughs> to figure out which, which is going to be valid, you know, when they just ask P and Q and they don't have anything else, you know, the, no example when it's just P and Q. Right, when it's just using the P and Q as placeholders instead of... Yeah, and they um, say if P is... <sighs> Uh, it's it's confusing to me the way they the way they word the but they had like four different things. Um, yeah. Uh, do you have the page for that? I have the book right here that I'm I'm looking for. I don't remember what page that was on. Oh, jeez, I don't. Uh, um, I don't know. Oh, but I, I, oh here it is. Here it is. I think it's page fifty. It looks like. Um, Uh, yeah, so that that is kind of um, one of those things. Again, we're not going to do everything that the book does um, with those particular ones. Uh, that that's kind of uh, checking um, whether you can just create the Venn diagram. Um, so the same same rules will apply. So you're you're going to look at. Um, 
is it a categorical proposition or is it a conditional? And then draw the associated Venn diagram. And then for the second premise, put in the appropriate X. But um, again, that, that's what it, just using the P and Q as placeholders is a little bit more in depth than what we want. Uh, so uh, I was like, my mind was going like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. So that's that they're kind of trying to generalize it, but that's going a little more in depth than we are wanting to go. Um, so the all of the uh, any any of the questions that will be on the exam will be similar to the ones uh, in the examples in class. It's going to be a, an actual argument. It won't have the P and the Q there. Okay. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps. Um, if you'd like to are we take a look, to read one E or just one D. Oh yes, uh, that's good. Good point. Um, I do want you guys to read one E, and there is a. There is a reading check on 1E, but we won't be lecturing on it and we won't be testing on it. So uh, 1E has some nice information, but it's one of those that's, it's kind of difficult to test on. Um, so we're not gonna test on that. Uh, okay. Yeah, and, and if you want to see any of those uh, arguments with the P and Q more in detail, uh, let me know. Um, and uh, I'll certainly, I can go through those during office hours or in an email, um, mm -hmm. but the the actual ones uh, questions that will appear on the exam will be uh, will will be uh, concrete arguments like what we've seen in class. It won't have the P and Q as placeholders. Uh, any other any other questions or comments? And, uh, just one. Uh, uh, it's like there's two different kinds of deductive. You said like there's the conditional and then the other one before that that's a categorical yeah the the categorical proposition mm -hmm. um so what's if let me um, those two? what was that what's the difference between the categorical and the conditional that is a good question let me uh let me answer that really quickly here i'm going to switch screens uh make sure that i select the right screen here we go um so I'm going to go to the notes from last lecture. That was the 31st. So the, the categorical propositions are these, these four statements. So all S or P is one of them. Oh, so I guess we used S and P, not, not P and Q, but that's all right. Uh, no SRP. Some SRP, some SR not P. So it's going to be one of those four statements, or it will be a conditional, which is our new statement today. This uh, if P then Q. So basically, it's just going to be one of those five statements as a premise, and that's that's the only difference. Um, the the book calls the other ones categorical propositions because we're saying something about the relationship between two sets between two categories. Whereas this one we're saying if P then Q, it's a little bit of a different statement, but essentially um, you're just going to have one of those five statements as one of the premises. So it's either gonna be if P then Q or it's going to be all SRP or no SRP, or some SRP, or some SR not P. So it's gonna be, the one premise will be one of those five statements. And then the other, the second premise will be um, someone or something is one of these objects, is a, is a cat, is a, is a fruit, is an, a food with sugar, something that is in the argument. Um, so you're just basically drawing the Venn diagram for the first premise. It's gonna be one of those five statements. And then for the second premise, put the X in the appropriate uh, circle. So um, did, that, did that answer your question? Or did I, did I talk past it? I do that sometimes. I think so. So okay. Uh, I guess because they call them S and P there and then they call them P and Q there, it gets a little confusing, but. Yeah, I don't like it when they switch there. I would I would just use P and Q for all of them. So um, if you want in your own uh, personal notes, 
what I would do all is I would PRQ. just go and yeah, all PRQ, uh, no PRQ, some PRQ, some PR not Q. Uh, I, I try and follow what the book does and I really don't like it when they switch notation like that, but they, they do that sometimes. So apologies for that. Um, any other so questions? When there's, when there's a conditional, the P is always the small one inside the Q circle. Uh, so it's it's the whatever one is first is always the smaller one. At, uh, so whatever is after if mm -hmm. is the small circle and whatever is after then is the big circle. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Okay. Okay, so let's Let's go to the next chapter then. Uh, so chapter two, uh, for this chapter, we are only having uh, two sections that we are uh, lecturing on, uh, 2A and 2B. Uh, now, the authors uh, titled this as Approaches to Problem Solving. Uh, so maybe let's write that down. Uh, so chapter two, approaches to problem solving. Uh, but we are going to have a, we're going to focus on units. Um, so we're going to first define what is a unit. And then we're going to look at different, uh, different applications and uses for units. So that's, that's kind of the, the direction we're going here. Um, so let's, let's start with the uh, section 2A. 2A, so the authors label this understand, solve, and explain. And so that is the title of the section. Uh, this first bit, there is a box on page 72 of the textbook that has three steps for problem solving. Step one is to understand the problem. Step two, step two is to solve the problem. And step three is to explain your results. Or result, I guess. Uh, now this, you can go into a lot more detail um, with these and the author, authors do, um, but I'm not going to be testing on on that box, there's, I, I believe I left in, I wanna say one homework problem, maybe two homework problems, probably just one. I think I just left in the one homework problem on, on that uh, process. So uh, I'm not gonna test on that first part, but that is um, what the author has as the steps to solving a problem. All right. Now, uh, before we get into defining a unit, let's uh, first look at fractions. So with, uh, with fractions or with, with units, uh, a lot of the units that we're going to be looking at here will be a fraction of some sort. Um, so we're gonna be looking at, take for example, speed will be a unit. We haven't quite defined that yet, but we will. Um, so we'll be looking at fractions and so um, this next part I'm going to have to do by hand since I don't know how to do the uh, the uh, mathematical <laughs> symbols uh, on typing in, in this platform. Uh, but there are rules for fractions. Oops. And this is... Uh, on page 74 in the textbook here, we're just going to do a quick review. So I'm not gonna go into any, uh, into a lot of detail here. And the reason for that is we are using, um, we're, go we're 
allowed to use calculators in this course. So I'm not too worried about the fine details of this, uh, but it is, is good to review it to at least uh, have an idea of what's going on. So the first rule we have is addition and subtraction. If we have two fractions with the same denominator, that is the same uh, bottom number, and we're adding, then the denominator stays the same. So we still have C and we add the numerators, we add the top. Or if we are subtracting, we do the same thing. So we have the same denominator and we are subtracting, then we just subtract the top, the bottom stays the same. Second rule is when we are multiplying A over B times C over D, we multiply across. So we multiply the numerators A times C, we multiply the denominators B times D. Third rule is division. So if we have A over B divided by C over D, we keep the first fraction the same. So A over B stays the same. We change the division to a multiply and we reciprocate the fraction. So we flip the second one, D over C. And now it's multiplication. So we just multiply across A times D over B times C. So these are the rules of fractions. Again, I'm not going to go into too much more detail. The book uh, on page 74 has a lot more detail and a lot of, uh, has some examples that it goes through. Um, but since we're using our calculator for that, I don't wanna to spend too much time on, on those. Uh, the next part is converting back and forth between decimals and fractions. And again, I'm just going to quickly go over this. Um, I am going to show you how to do this on your calculator. So, uh, so again, uh, this would be if you want to do this by hand, which is fine. Um, but for the most part, we're going to use our, our calculators for this. So uh, let's say we have a decimal that we want to convert into a fraction. So let's say we have uh, 0 0.497 and we want to know what is this as a fraction. So what we are going to do uh, is you look at the number of digits after the decimal place and you count how many digits there are. Oh, I have a question. Oh yes, that's fine. Um, if you have to go, that's fine. I am recording this so you can catch the, the last bit on, on there. Uh, three digits is correct. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is we have, in our denominator, we're going to have a one with those many zeros. So three zeros, since we have three digits, one, zero, zero, zero. Then what we put in the numerator are the digits without the decimal. So 497. So this 0.497 as a fraction is 497 out of 1000. And we can, um, the next step would be to simplify, but again, our calculators will do that. I will show you, uh, I think I might have to start next class with, with that, but I'll show you how to uh, simplify using your calculator. Uh, let's do one more. Let's say if we have uh, 0 0.01 and we wanna convert this into a fraction, what do we do? Well, again, Um, that is that is a good question. For this one, for this first exam, I want to say yes. You're going to simplify your fractions, uh, but again, the the calculators will do that for for you. So I'll I'll show you how to do that, how to get your calculator to simplify it. Um, but again, I might have to start next class with that since we're almost out of time here. Um, so with this one, we have two digits. So we'd have a uh, one with two zeros or 100 in the bottom. And then the numerator would be the digits without the decimals would be zero one, or uh, usually we just leave out that. So we just call it one. So that's one out of 100. To go the other way, if we had a fraction like one fourth, what we would do is we would take one divided by four. And if you do that you know, using long division, eventually you'll get to 0 0.25. But again, with your calculator, you can just do one divided by four and it will give you the, the decimal 
directly. Uh, so that's converting back and forth from fractions to decimals and the rules of fractions. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, we're out of time. So let's stop there. At the beginning of next class, let me, let me, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll leave this on the screen for a moment. Um, so at the beginning of next class, I'm going to show you uh, where to find those buttons on your calculator and how to use those to uh, uh, simplify to simplify a fraction and to convert a, a decimal into a fraction using your calculator and back back and forth. And then we will uh, jump into what is a unit and uh, the applications for units, which is the main uh, meat of this section. So that's what we'll start with uh, with next class. Uh, any last minute questions before I let you guys go? Let me click on that. Okay, um, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks again for your patience. Uh, this, uh, you know, uh, remote classes are still a new thing to me. So trying to figure out the best way to do notes is, is always a challenge, but um, uh, I, I appreciate your patience. Uh, and if you haven't, if you haven't uh, typed in here yet, please uh, be sure to do so before you leave. Otherwise, have a wonderful day and I will see you on Thursday. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.